Mountain climbers are always driven by the ambition to achieve greater heights. For those who live a good adrenaline rush, they always look for the higher mountains. Everest has been conquered by many, which has made it a lesser challenge. However, another mountain summit known as K2 has proven to be even deadlier. This is the world's second highest summit and the true climber's mountain. The world learned about its dangers and challenges in August 2008, when 11 climbers perished within a span of 30 hours. And among these climbers was Gerard McDonnell. But what happened at the top? Today, we will look at the terrifying last moments of Ger McDonnell, the hero of the K2 2008 disaster. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more intriguing stories like this one. And with that, let's find out the inside story of what went wrong. The three climbers had made it to the top, and they watched as the sun's last sliver traced the Earth's curvature in a belt of dying flame. The entire Baltoro Glacier was already dark two miles below, just as the darkness was overhead. One after another, the massive peaks of the Karakoram winked out, and within a short time the sun vanished, the brief twilight swallowing the mountain on which they stood. K2 was the highest and least forgiving in the range. In fact, it is so dangerous that one in every four climbers who have reached the summit has died trying. But this time, the three climbers, Gerard McDonnell, Marco Confortola, and Wilco Van Ruijen, had reached the top. Deep down, they knew they had experienced something no sane mountaineer would ever wish to witness, a sunset from more than 27,000 feet. Very few who have seen this fantastic view have lived to tell the story. At this altitude, every breath feels like a struggle, given that every breath only has a third of the oxygen at sea level. The mountaineers started feeling their bodies and brains shutting down, but nothing could compare to what was coming. With the darkness, they would have to fight through a temperature of minus 40 degrees that would singe any exposed flesh. However, driven by nothing but pure ambition, the experienced mountaineers Gerard, Marco, and Wilco had pressed their luck when they went up the mountain so late in the day. When they got to the top, they were very jubilant. They were standing at the top of K2, which was at an altitude of 28,251 feet. There was every reason to celebrate this achievement. Marco waved the Italian flag from a trekking pole, and Gerard held an Irish one overhead. To celebrate the win, an adventure-loving 37-year-old named Gerard called his girlfriend using a satellite phone to tell her of his victory. They were all overjoyed by this achievement, including Wilco, a 40-year-old Dutchman with a wife and a nine-month-old baby. However, having watched the sunset, they knew it was getting late, and they had no time to waste. But looking back, they couldn't find the rope. When they were going up the mountain summit, they relied on a single rope to guide them through the treacherous labyrinth of ice and stone near the summit. The rope was even more essential for them to go down, because one misstep could send them all plummeting off the face. Furthermore, none of them carried any rope going up, planning instead to rely on the ones that had been anchored to the ice. Realizing they couldn't see the rope, they switched on their headlamps and scanned the slope. But no matter how hard they searched, the rope was nowhere to be seen. They were now stranded with no way down, especially in the dark. They were on top of the world yet cut off from it, with absolutely no idea that they would be key figures in an unfolding tragedy. This was a tragedy that sent rumors bouncing around the globe, from garbled internet updates all the way to the front page of the New York Times. As they went up the summit, they made some errors in judgment, which cascaded into one of the worst disasters in the history of mountaineering. On that morning, more than 20 climbers had set out for the summit. But by the time the devastating chain of events of August 1st and 2 were over, 11 climbers from seven countries would be dead. As night fell on August 1st, far too high on the flanks of the world's second highest peak, the most important thing was survival. And so, using his ice axe, Marco made makeshift seats for himself and Gerard. Wilco later joined them, and the three prepared for every climber's nightmare an open bivouac above 27,000 feet. Wilco recalls, We said nothing to each other because we had nothing to say. Even though they had heavy, down-filled climbing suits on them, Gerard's legs were dangerously cold. To help his friend, Marco rubbed them. As if it couldn't get worse, Wilco had lost his water bottle, and none of them had any food. They also lacked bottled oxygen because they didn't believe in climbing with it. 
deep down, they all knew that the only thing left was to save themselves, given that they couldn't be rescued at that height. Ten hours later, on what would be the last morning of his life, Gerard McDonnell woke up shivering in his down suit. He had managed to doze off on the small snow ledge that Marco had carved for him. The first light came at around 5 a.m., and when it was here, Gerard could see that Marco and Wilco had also made it through the night. However, even in the daylight, the route was still unclear. Gerard and Marco stood and traversed back and forth across the slope as they tried to find a way down. Wilco, who had lost his water bottle, was severely dehydrated at this point. It was severe to the point that he started to go snow blind. Having waited for a considerable amount of time, Wilco reached his limit and declared that he would no longer engage in discussion. He expressed his determination to descend, emphasizing his need to survive, regardless of whether it was the correct direction or not, maintaining his decision to go straight down. He then departed from his companions and began his journey alone. As if by luck, Wilco somehow stumbled upon the correct route down to the top of the traverse. However, the rope was gone, and he was about to find out why as he went further down. He came across a group of three Korean climbers who were severely tangled in the ropes. One was even dangling upside down. From the looks of it, the Koreans had been out all night and were in terrible shape. They were semi-conscious and unable to stand, as the weather had taken a toll on them. One of the Koreans managed to tell Wilco that they had radioed for help, and a rescue party of Sherpas and other Koreans was on its way up. Wilco, who couldn't do much for them, left them his spare gloves and continued his descent. During a press conference after this whole tragedy, another member of the Korean team stormed up to Wilco and basically accused him of leaving the three Koreans hanging on the mountain. Wilco responded to him saying, it was a question of survival. There was nothing more I could do to help them and they said that they were waiting to be rescued. A hundred yards below, Wilco looked back and saw that Gerard and Marco had followed him on the route he was using. And from where he was standing, he could see that they had arrived at the Koreans. Too exhausted to go back up, he shouted at them, but there was no response. All five seemed to be barely moving. Disoriented, Wilco wandered farther and farther down the steeps, free climbing down an unknown route. He was already lost and had no idea where he was in relation to Camp 4, which was the point where they started. His only notion was that down was good. From then on, the events become confused in the memory fog of hypoxia, exhaustion, and cold. Later, Marco claimed that he and Gerard had stopped for three hours to help the dying Koreans. However, according to Wilco, if they had stopped for that long, it would have been suicide. But whatever the case, Marco said that they would slump over every time he tried to get the Koreans to stand. He recalled how one Korean was bootless, and Marco had tried to cover one foot with a spare glove. By mid-morning, Marco and Gerard had left the Koreans and continued with their journey downward. Marco was a trained mountain rescuer, but he was so sick that he couldn't help the Koreans. However, his own situation was growing desperate. He could barely feel his frozen toes as he kicked his crampons into the ice. Marco later said that, out of nowhere, Gerard turned around and began climbing back up the slope toward the Koreans. He never even offered any explanation as to why. Marco went on along the traverse and down into the couloir. He had been out on the mountain for over 30 hours and later said that he had dozed off in the snow. He was awakened by a loud cracking noise far above as another icefall roared down the mountain. And with this, Marco watched in horror as his friend, Gerard, was swept toward him in a rolling mass of ice and snow, which would come to a halt about 50 feet away. From a distance, he could see Gerard's boots sticking out of the ice, his body ripped apart and strewn across the slope by the force of the slide. Marco and Gerard had only known each other briefly, having met in base camp that spring. But weeks later, he would end up breaking into tears at the memory of his friend, whom he had nicknamed Jesus. They had conquered one of his worst and scariest nights. When Marco was interviewed about the incident, he told the interviewer, he was always smiling. He was a flower. Gerard had such an impact on everyone around him. He was loved by so many that in Ireland, he even had a memorial service that had more than 2,000 mourners. What was supposed to be an amazing adventure ended up claiming the life of a young and ambitious man. Along with 10 other people, 
they were honored by their countries for their bravery in going up to such a deadly summit. Gerard McDonnell will forever be remembered for his bravery and kind heart, offering to go back to help the Koreans even though nothing else could be done. He was a true hero, one that will forever be remembered. And with that, we have come to the end of our video. Before you go, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more intriguing stories like this one. Thanks for watching.